Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, what a joy it is for me to proclaim your word to the young people of Ark Victory Church as the church turns 19. It is a joy for me to proclaim your word to the young people, 19 or thereabout, plus or minus, in this youth service. We thank you for the faithful, wonderful ministry of Pastor Jay, Pastor Anjali, and the wonderful team all these years. Oh Lord, we are grateful to you. And even as I bring the word of God to these young people, Lord, the truth of I am to this iPhone generation, the Bible to the Google generation. And this morning, as the Holy Spirit has moved my heart, the story of Samson to the Samsung generation, I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to us. Help us to look into our heart to see the Samson inside us and turn to you you who took the punishment of Samson on the cross and commit our life to you 100%. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You know, it was a match that I truly enjoyed watching yesterday with uh, joining a lack of Indians in Ahmedabad, India, beating Pakistan. And, and I've been very impressed by our captain, our leader, Indian cricket captain, Rohit Sharma. You know, I read this about him uh, yesterday. I think it was in the Indian Express. It said, uh, England not only raised the bar in the ODI cricket when they won the World Cup in 2019, but they also set a template for the way modern white ball cricket was being played. For a long time, India continued to play the traditional way but then one man took over, Rohit Sharma took over Indian cricket. And he's been leading from the front, an exemplary leader. He has been talking about playing attacking brand of cricket throughout the innings. And he has not only talked the talk, but also walking the walk. He looked to attack the bowlers in the first 10 hours of the innings and he has shown this in this World Cup. Uh, in, uh, in his, uh, ma the match against Afghanistan, 131 runs of 84 balls, including five sixes. 86 runs of 63 balls over Pakistan, a knock that included six sixes. An exemplary leader. But today I'm going to talk to you about a person in the Bible who was not exemplary. Who was a leader who was not exemplary by any stretch of imagination. Come with me to the world of football. Uh, in the dying minutes, French midfielder forward, I would not know. Uh, Kulu Manali. I know Kulu Manali is a place in India, but a French French player. By he almost put the ball past Argentine goalie Emiliano Martinez. But Emiliano Martinez guarded the Argentine goal where the score was 3-3 in the World Cup football final of 2022. He guarded the goal with all his heart. And then after the, that, that match, you know that Argentina won the World Cup, uh, he set a record of having, ensuring his team has seven straight clean sheets. 609 minutes without conceding a goal as uh, Argentina beat one oh, Paraguay 1-0. I think it was in the World, World Cup qualifiers. You know, here was this Argentine goalie guarding his goal as if his life depended on it. And that reminds us of what we take from camp. You know, we had wonderful days of youth camp, uh, 1st of October, 2nd of October. You know, we are called to guard our salvation the way El Emiliano Martinez guarded the Argentine goal. Take our salvation seriously. Walk in holiness. And again, talking about the guy I want to talk about today, Samson, Samson was not very serious about guarding his holiness. 
he was not serious about living a holy life but i want to still talk about him because from his negative example in the next 15 minutes we will learn some positive lessons but one one thing i want to tell you that samson was chosen judges chapter 13 2 to 5 if you read it you know he was born to his parents who had no children but samson was born because god had a grand plan for him and god sent samson into the family of his parents it was he was chosen by god and he was also called to be a nazarite when you read judges chapter 13 2 to 5 nazarite not just an ordinary follower of god but a person with an extraordinary dedication as bible teacher John MacArthur would say dedication by separation and uh, what is who's this Nazarite Samson was a Nazarite separation from great products the Bible explains in numbers chapter 6 3 to 4 you know separation why are not having a haircut so he grew his hair long numbers 6 5 separation by not con contacting any dead bodies numbers 6 6 to 7 and then, most of all, Numbers 6 and verse 8, throughout the period of this dedication, he had to be consecrated to the Lord. He had to be holy to the Lord. And that is our call. When we came out of camp, we also dedicated our life to be consecrated to the Lord. And we also, throughout a period of dedication, and that is for the rest of our life or till the return of Jesus, we need to be consecrated to the Lord. Why? Why? You know, I want to remind you because there is a command in the Bible that talks about it. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 3 to 5 and verse 7 says, You should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each one of you should learn to control his body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. It's God's will that every one of us live a holy life. A command that every one of us live a sexually pure life. The Bible is very clear in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Not just that, we don't live a holy life just because, you know, it's a command from God. We live a holy life because it's a jolly life. Holy life is actually a jolly life. Because the Bible, when speaking about sin, in Hebrews 11.25 says, There is pleasure in sin, but that sin, pleasure is only temporary. It's, the Bible uses the phrase, fleeting pleasures of sin. And the Bible says in Psalm 16 and verse 11, There are eternal pleasures at His right hand. You know, I could talk about this for the next one hour or two hours, but that will not be of any use. But you, when you choose... To turn away from porn watching. When you choose to refuse to use that foul word when you're severely provoked. Because you love Jesus and you enjoy the joy that comes from his presence. There's a joy that comes which the world cannot give you. Which money cannot buy. Which the devil cannot take away. I'm talking about that joy. And that is why I want to tell you this young, this young people. This afternoon, holy life is indeed a joy life. So we are holy because of the command of God. Because of the cheer it brings. But Samson blew it. But Samson blew it. Even though he was chosen, even though he was a believer, when he went to live in his world and he was called to be a leader by God, chosen to be a special leader, a Nazarite, he blew it. First thing that he blew was when he... One, one, one sin after the other. And this sin that he first committed was sinful soulmate selection. Sinful soulmate selection. The Bible says in Judges chapter 14, Samson went to a place called Timnah. And he saw a young Philistine woman. I think Samson was bowled over by her beauty. And he went to his father and mother and said, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. He looked at a girl and as a consecrated follower of the living God, Yahweh, 
He knew from the Old Testament. He knew from Exodus 34, 11 to 16 and several other passages. I will not go into that. That as a consecrated follower of Yahweh, he had to marry another consecrated follower of Yahweh. But he just saw a woman. He saw her flesh and said, I'm going to get married to her. Maybe that's something that you are tempted to do or you are already in the midst of that temptation of giving your heart away to an unbeliever. Be very careful. That was Samson's first sin. The first sin as he was trying to live out his life of you know, dedication as he was trying to live out his life of you know, consecration. You know, he saw this woman, this, the girl from Timnah and wanted to marry her against the commands of God, which his parents actually rightly reminded him of. But he, that, those fell on deaf ears. Those fell on deaf ears. You know, I want to keep moving here. And Sam's, Sam's son was called to be consecrated. Samson was called to be an, a, 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 a Nazarite, a special follower of Yahweh. And you too are called to be that. Because God in His mercy and God in His plan has put you in this wonderful local church where you get good, solid food Sunday after Sunday and you have wonderful fellowship. You know, God has got a plan. But are you like Samson this morning? And then Samson went not only into a sinful soulmate selection, he went into a sinful snacking. Because to meet this girl, he traveled to Timnah, and on the way, he killed a lion. And then when he came back, there was a honeycomb inside that lion, and Samson ate that honeycomb. But according to the Nazarite law, in number six, he was not supposed to go near a dead body, leave alone, touch a dead body, and eat what was in a dead body. That was a special call. As a special follower of Yahweh, as a special follower of the living God, as a disciple of Jesus, do, you, do we sinfully snack? We know that Netflix show, that hot star show, that Amazon Prime show is actually soft porn but still we snack it, even though we know the word, even though we know from the word of God, the thing that David did displeased the Lord. David watched light porn and displeased the Lord. Even though we know this displeases the Lord, we still sinfully snack. It's something we must be very, very careful about. Sinful snacking. And then sinful handling of a romantic split up Judges chapter 15 the story moves on Samson's story is from Judges 13 14, 15, 16 4 chapters Judges 15 you know Samson to cut a long story short he married that woman from Timnah but that woman walked away from his life and I'm sure Samson wept when his wife walked away from him he would have Talk to himself, daddy and mommy were right. They told me, they warned me about this relationship. They warned me based on the word of God, but I did not obey. And Samson must have wept. We don't know. But then he went, he goes to visit his wife in Judges 15. And his father-in-law speaks rudely to him. He's not able to meet his wife. And his father-in-law says, I gave your wife to your companions. And Samson is not able to handle that breakup. Samson catches hold of 300 foxes, ties them tail to tail in pairs, fastened the torch to every pair of tails, lit the torches and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. There was a great disaster because because of this romantic breakup, Samson is angry. Maybe you're going through a romantic breakup. I do not know. 
Samson was doing the right thing, trying to make his marriage work, which 1 Corinthians chapter 7 talks about. Having married an unbeliever, he was trying to make his relationship work. Marrying an unbeliever was wrong, but having married an unbeliever, you need to make your marriage work. So I'm not getting into that, but Samson was not able to handle the romantic rejection. So he reacts in anger, catching these foxes, lighting up the, making the foxes like a bomb and causing agricultural destruction. You know, when, when, when God makes someone you love walk away from you, listen to his voice. Maybe God, especially if you are in love with an unbeliever, you know, listen to his voice. Because in Hosea chapter 2, verse 6, the Bible says, Hosea 2, verse 6, I put a block in a path with thorn bushes. God blocks your stubbornness in going ahead with that romantic relationship with the unbeliever. He blocks it with a thorn bush. Are you listening to his voice? God is speaking to you. He says, I told you in 1 Corinthians 7 39, as a believer, you don't marry an unbeliever. You don't get involved in a, with a, in a romantic relationship with an unbeliever, but you're still going ahead. So I will make her go away. I put a thorn bush in your path. Hosea 2 6. Listen to his voice. Handle your rejection in a mature way. Asking God to give you grace. Not in anger like Samson. And not just in sinful soulmate selection. Not just in sinful snacks. Not just in sinful handling of a romantic split up. He was into actually sleeping with a prostitute. Sinful sleeping with a, with a sex worker. If you read Judges 15, because of Samson's causing agricultural disaster in Philistine, in the land of Philistia, thousand men were about to attack him. Samson defeated them with a jawbone. One guy, he was the original Vajinika, okay? He was the original Vajinika. One guy beating thousand people. But then he was so thirsty. And Judges 15 towards the end, God opened the ground and gave him some water to drink, more tasty than, you know, Coca-Cola, more tasty than Pepsi. God did a miracle for him. But after the miracle in the next chapter, very, the next chapter actually, there's no chapter in verse divisions, you know, when, when that portion was originally written by the Holy Spirit, Samson goes and sleeps with a prostitute. And then the enemies come and they try to surround him. Samson finishes his work with the prosecute, gets up, and then he lifts the gate up and walks out. You know, before the sexual sin, miracle. After the sexual sin, miracle. The power remains. You know, the last thing you want to do after youth camp, after you come to the Lord, after you accepted Jesus, after you're walking in holiness, is to take the grace of God for granted. God does miracles for you because he loves you, because he has chosen you. You know, God will do a lot of wonders in your life. But if you're going to sandwich miracles with sexual sin, you are in danger, my friend. I am in danger. So we must be careful. That we don't take the grace of God as a license for immorality. As Jude warns us in Jude verse 3 and 4. Samson. Is there a Samson inside our life? He was a he-man with she-weakness. A he-man with a she-weakness. One more thing and I'm ready to pray with you. One more. Sinful soulmate selection, sinful handling of a romantic split up, sinful sleeping of a sex worker, taking the grace of God for granted. And then in chapter 16, his affair with Delilah. You know, Delilah was again not a believer. Samson took out, could have technically had a relationship with her because he had, by this time, Judges 15 6 says Samson's first wife was dead. At least then he at least has some sense. But again, he goes into marrying an unbeliever. And if you read Judges 13, 16 carefully, at least four times the Bible uses the word yeah, room and Samson getting up from sleep, which I understand Samson was getting into a, 
a physical relationship in a locked room setting with an unbeliever called Delilah who trapped him, who fooled him. But Samson still didn't learn the lesson. She was trying to tie him up with a rope, with, uh, with, uh, with his hair, with, this, with a bowstring. But Samson still went and lay on her lap. And the Bible, some versions use the word lulled. She lulled him to sleep. And some Bible scholars say there was sexual activity between Samson and Delilah. He reached a climax. So he slept after the climax on the lap of Delilah. Samson went into sleep one night stand to sleeping with a woman. Possibly having sexual experiences with her four nights straight. Going from back to us. I want you to close your eyes. All heads closed. All heads bowed. And I'm going to give you a call right now. A call which says, as we read in Judges 16 and verse 28, we know what happened to Samson. Samson was caught by the enemies. He told the secret. His head was shaved. He lost all power. He didn't know that God's presence left him. God's presence left him. He became powerless. He was captured by the enemies. He was chained. He was chained between two pillars. In that time, in Judges 16, 18, he prays a prayer. Lord, give me strength one more time. Lord, give me strength one more time. That's what Samson prayed. Lord, give me strength one more time. Samson goofed it up. After God called him, after God consecrated him, he kept goofing up unbelievably. At the end, he prayed. Lord, give me strength one more time. And I'm inviting you, young person, young friend. Would you make Samson's last minute prayer your every second prayer? What Samson prayed in his last minute of his life, when he was about to die, pushing away that pillar. When the pillar, when the building came, came crashing down, when people died, he was still being an agent of Yahweh. In the context of the Old Testament, he was being God's general, fulfilling his purpose finally. Not running behind a new girl as he did in every new chapter, every few verses. He was having a new girlfriend, a new sexual relationship. Not doing that, finally he said, Lord, give me strength this one more, this time, just this one more time. And God gave him strength because our God is a gracious God. He loves you. He loves you very much. You might goof up, you might want to go away, but all he wants is your repentance and not your riddance. Will you, if you come back, if you come back to him, as he gave strength to Samson that day, he gave strength to Samson. Samson pushed the building. He fulfilled God's purpose there. And in Hebrews chapter 11, his name is entered in the list of believers. If you read Hebrews 11. So would you pray that prayer? That Samson's last second prayer. Will you make it your prayer every second of your life? If you say that, I want you to raise your hands. If you say, I'm going to make Samson's last second prayer my every second prayer. Every minute, every waking minute, I'm going to pray that. Lord, give me strength to fulfill your purpose. The purpose for which you sent me to this earth. Lord, to be a witness in that school. To be a witness in my college. To be a witness in my workplace. That to be a light unto the Gentiles. To be a consecrated disciple of Jesus. All that you call me for. All that you created me for. Give me strength to do that. I'm going to make that prayer. And that's my prayer now. If you say that, I want you to raise your hands. Yes, thank you. Raise it, raise it. Yes, yes, thank you. Do, do, can you do something? Can you get up? Can you get up? Can you get up from your seats? If you're breaking Samson's last minute prayer as your regular prayer, I'll make it in my regular prayer. Get up from your seats. Yes, get up. My altar call is very specific. I'm saying, okay, what Samson prayed at the fag end of his life, you're not going to be like him, you know, lining up sin after sin, sexual sin after sexual sin, but you're going to, what he did at the end, you're going to say, Lord, every moment, every, whatever responsibility that you do for this local church, whatever responsibility that you are called to do in your college workplace, you're, you're, saying, you're going to pray, Lord, I can't do this with my own strength. This is, your 
the opportunity that you have given me so graciously. And I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray like Sam said. What he did in the last minute. I'm going to pray every day. Lord, give me strength this one time. Because you don't know how long you're going to live. You don't, I don't know how long I'm going to live. You don't know when the Lord is going to return. So this could be the last opportunity. I'm going to give it my best. Enabled by his strength which I will receive through specific prayer. This prayer. Lord. Lord. Give me strength one more time. To be what you want me to be in this place. Can you say that young people? As I finish. Can you say these words, not just because I'm asking you but to, but really realizing what we've been listening to the last 15 minutes, last 20 minutes. Would you pray this prayer? Lord, repeat, Lord, give me strength one more time to do what you have called me to do in this place right now, right this second. Right this nanosecond. Lord, give me strength. Give me grace. Give me wisdom. Give me everything I need. One more time. This moment. So that the purpose for which you have called me. The purpose for which I am in this place. I will fulfill. For the glory of your name. For the building of your kingdom. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.